It may well be now, though, that that after you know the developments of this year, after the war in Ukraine, that we could be headed towards uh, you know a, a world that is much more rigidly divided uh, between uh, you know the West and and uh, the mm. Sino-Russian Entente, right? So if that's the core lesson, right, that you're never going to have a stable uh, regional order that excludes, by and large, uh, you know the most powerful country in that region, that's a lesson we have to apply to the, to the Pacific theater as well, mm. right? We we cannot create an Indo-Pacific strategy or paradigm as a, as a way of avoiding answering the question of what we have to do about China, right? Hello, I'm Chris Dixon, Director of the Global Policy Institute. Welcome back to this second segment of our conversation over the implications of the Ukraine war with Dr. Zachary Pekin, Senior Fellow at the Global Policy Institute, as well as a researcher in the EU Foreign Policy Unit at the Center for European Policy Studies and a research fellow with the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy in Toronto. Many commentators in the West are suggesting that the invasion of the Ukraine is a truly watershed moment in the history of the global order, suggesting in particular that it's the point in time where the West finally woke up to the threats posed by the rising powers and China and Russia in particular. I wonder what your view was on this. Uh, is, it, is, it, is this something that's far too early to speculate on? Um, is it, in fact, a completely naive view of the way in which the global system evolves? Uh, no, I mean, I think that's, that's pretty much right. We're seeing the uh, you know, direct use of military force in the context of a massive interstate war in Europe. That is a clear dividing line in history. So you know, any previous attempt to construct a, a liberal world order in which you know, the expectation in the 1990s was that you know, the, the world would embrace Western values, liberal democracy, human rights, uh, you know, uh, uh, ultra-materialist uh, consumer, consumerist capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, and, and of course, beyond that, Western geopolitical leadership, right? I mean, those are all, you know, presumably pillars of, of the so-called liberal world order. Um, you know, that, that's not going to happen. I mean, that, this is a clear dividing line on, on that front. Um, so I think we can be certain about that. As it relates to Europe's relationship with Russia, uh, this is probably also a very significant dividing line, right? Uh, uh, you know, in, in, in 2014 already, I think it was pretty clear, you know, that, that there would not be a liberal world order, right? That, that the Western-led liberal order would not encompass the globe. Uh, by, by 2014, we knew that already. Uh, by 2022, I think now uh, there aren't going to be that many voices in the in the West, um, particularly in, in, in Europe anymore, who are going to be, you know, calling for um, understanding and, and empathizing with Russia's security concerns or grievances and the like. 2014 didn't bring that to an end. And in, in 2014, there were still, you know, uh, Europe was still largely divided on this question. There were some in Europe who were, you know, calling for a more hawkish approach, but there are others who were you know, calling for dialogue and, and for strategic empathy and the like with Russia. I think that the era of strategic empathy is probably over. Uh, hopefully there will be some cooler heads calling, you know, for sensible uh, restrained foreign policy on, on the part of the West so that we don't see the situation escalate possibly to the level of a NATO-Russia war. Um, but I don't think you're going to be seeing Western political leaders, you know, lining up anymore to, to you know, meet with representatives of, of the Russian government. I think that that, that era is largely over. So, uh, uh, you know, this really is a break point, do you think, that we've reached? No question. I mean, we, we don't know precisely what the future is going to look like. We don't know what no. China's place in the future order is going to look like or the future of Russia-China relations. We can, you know, glean, uh, you know, certain uh, 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 understandings or, or make certain predictions at this point, uh, but not complete predictions. Uh, but but nonetheless, I mean, yes, obviously, you know, there, there is no return to the status quo ante now. There, there is no, uh, the way that there, after 2014, there were still attempts to put forward multiple pathways to resolving the mounting crisis between Russia and the West to de-escalate, to put together confidence building measures, um, you know, basically to, to try to salvage whatever was possible of, of, you know, a common European space. You know, it might not be a single space from Lisbon to Vladivostok rooted in common values, but some sort of 
you know, cooperative or inclusive order that could, um, you know, find some sort of way of, of reconciling the different interests that exist in, in, in Europe through dialogue. I mean, I, I think that that's, that's largely gone right now. And, and, you know, Russia's actions right here are just so uh, condemnable, so reprehensible and so shocking to so many uh, that, you know, it's going to be very difficult to imagine there being the political will or the, the, the desire in the West to, you know, engage Russia on that front anytime soon. Uh, and it's quite worrisome because obviously during the Cold War, you know, nonetheless, there was, uh, you know, a desire to respect the rules of the game, particularly after, after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, le less so in the in the hot phase of the Cold War at the beginning, but nonetheless, there was a there was this desire to respect the the tacit rules of the game, uh, you know, to have two stable and largely equal in terms of power, you know, spheres of influence or blocks, which could serve as a, as a stabilizing force. You don't have that now. You have an asymmetry of power between NATO and Russia. Uh, so a lot of the factors that helped to bring stability, or at least a modicum of stability during the Cold War, are not present now, uh, and it's part of what you know drove us to. To where we are right now, right? Russia is prepared to take uh, greater risks because they're the less powerful party when compared with NATO, and the game is being played right on their doorstep, right? The the Iron Curtain is no longer, you know, uh, present in in Austria, right? It's no, it's not Austria that's the neutral buffer state between uh, East and West. You know, we were talking about moving that all the way over to Ukraine, and clearly Ukraine didn't even want to be neutral either. They wanted to join the West. So, you know, th there isn't any buffer, verily, at, at this point. Even Finland is starting to talk about joining NATO. Uh, so, you know, th th this is where we are right now. It's not a great place to be, and it might be, it's entirely possible, it might be several years uh, before we see the political will in the West to start talking about ways to provide a modicum of predictability into this new rivalry between Russia and the West. But you know, I, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. We even just saw today um, the, uh, the foreign ministers or, or secretaries of state of, of the US, Canada, Norway, Sweden, uh, uh, Finland, and Denmark. That is to say, you know, all, all the other members of, of uh, the Arctic Council, save for Russia, you know, release a joint statement saying that under the current circumstances, we're putting cooperation in the Arctic Council on pause. You know, that's, that's a big that's a big development because you know the Arctic Council has been renowned for finding ways to insulate the Arctic region and cooperation in the Arctic from geopolitical disputes that happen in, in other regions, right? Cooperation on the environment, on science, on advancing indigenous rights mm -hmm. and the like. Uh, and, and that, uh, you know, if that's being put on, on pause right now, uh, it shows that, that everything is basically fair game at this point. Okay. So we are, we are at a real break point. A deeply, a deeply ideologically divided system uh, and with much more inbuilt instability. It sounds a great world we're moving into. Unlike during the, um, unlike during the Cold War when you know, the, the Western and Eastern blocs did clearly represent two different ideologies in, in capitalism and communism, a lot of people have been pointing out in recent years, some savvy analysts have been pointing out that Russia and China don't have a, an ideological partnership, right? It's a much more pragmatic partnership uh, the two countries have, although they may both be authoritarian countries, their domestic political systems are nonetheless very, very different from, from each other, and that they don't even share identical conceptions of international order either, besides, you know, sort of the basic parameters of opposing, you know, U.S. and Western hegemony and, and, and the like, and opposing so-called non-interference in, in at least their uh, domestic affairs, clearly not in the affairs of countries like Ukraine. Um, it, it may well be now, though, that that after you know the developments of this year, after the war in Ukraine, that we could be headed towards uh, you know a, a world that is much more rigidly divided uh, between uh, you know the West and and uh, the mm. Sino-Russian Entente. Right uh, up until now, uh, the the maxim of the Sino-Russian Entente has been uh, you know never against each other, but not always with each other. Right, so both sides wanted to maintain their room for maneuver. Uh, it could be that if these sanctions, uh, which are devastating, remain in place indefinitely uh, against Russia, uh, that Russia will basically have no other choice but to deepen its partnership significantly uh, with China. I don't know if that will necessarily result in a full-blown formal alliance, uh, but nonetheless, you know, Russia's room to maneuver will be significantly uh, limited, uh, which brings to mind, uh, you know, certainly the the historical context that existed on the eve of World War One as well, in which you also saw rigidly formed alliances on on the European continent that, you know, unfortunately were inflexible and and once activated triggered a continent-wide war. 
Zach, I just wanted to come back on this idea of these two rigid blocks. Um, I mean, I've given that a lot of thought for many years, in fact. Um, but that there are some nuances there, I, I think, and I'm sure you'd agree. Um, in many ways, I think Washington will be quite happy with um, two blocks. Uh, President Biden in his uh, State of the Union address talked about um, uh, this is a situation of democracies versus autocracies. But I'd like to know who, for whom he's actually sort of talking on behalf of. Um, democracies? Well, OK, United States, the world's second largest democracy, but I don't see India, the world's largest uh, democracy, coming on board. In fact, the State Department today is looking even at uh, potential sanctions on India for purchasing Russian weapons. Um, and aside from India, well, you've got the world's third largest democracy, Indonesia, the world's fourth largest democracy, supposedly, uh, Pakistan, and the world's fifth largest democracy, clearly Brazil. Um, and, and, and none of these countries have, have really condemned Russia, and they certainly have not considered the application of sanctions. And it seems to me that it's more than just democracies versus autocracies, or even rigid blocks. It seems to me to be a situation also of rich versus poor, developed versus developing. I think that's a another sort of component to all of this. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Well, for sure. And, and this whole democracies versus autocracies uh, rhetoric has, has been out of step with a lot of global realities, as you've rightly highlighted. Uh, you know, um, but Joe Biden was facing this, for example, in the lead up to his so-called summit for democracy, in mm -hmm. which, you know, he, he faced the question, OK, you know, do I invite the Philippines and Turkey and countries like that, which you know, maybe electoral democracies, but are basically verging on not exactly being full democracies. Uh, you know, do, do we invite them in order to build a bigger coalition and face the humiliation of sort of having to sit next to Erdogan and Duterte and say, you know, these people are our are, are allies in the global struggle for democracy? Uh, or alternatively, do you not invite them and basically risk, risk pushing them further away from, from the Western alliance, uh, push the Philippines closer into China's embrace, uh, you know, to push uh, Turkey, you know, closer to, to making deals with Russia. Um, you know, so it, it, it's not an easy answer. And I think that the world is just too complicated, obviously, just to divide it so simplistically along ideological lines. And that doesn't mean that that rigid blocks, geopolitical blocks can't emerge. And that doesn't mean that ideological rhetoric will not win the day. I think that ideological rhetoric is quite dangerous. Um, so, yes, I mean, perhaps I should correct myself and, and say that, you know, we're, we're not necessarily looking empirically at the emergence of two ideological blocks, but, you know, ideas matter and norms matter. And if we in the West believe that, uh, then that certainly has the potential to structure and, and shape the nature of global politics over the years and decades to come. And, uh, and I mean, it has already. And, um, you know, just to go one step further to that, I mean, given the dividing lines that are deepening and the walls are getting higher, right, and the rhetoric is getting stronger, um, do you think that a lot of countries that could be described as having sort of sat on the wall and have tried to stay relatively neutral between these sort of emerging blocks or geopolitical alliances, uh, etc., will now find it much harder to re uh, retain that position. We've seen what uh, Germany's massive U-turn uh, over the last few days, which um, I guess could have been expected. Um, but there's a lot of other countries, whether it is in the Middle East, um, Brazil, um, many other parts of the world, who maybe find themselves in a similar or even more precarious position. Um, will they be es essentially forced by emerging realities to choose more clearly in the, you know, next few years and months and years ahead um, be, where they sort of position themselves geopolitically? Uh, so it, within Europe, certainly, th there's no question that there's there's a new rigid dividing line in Europe, right? And that was already becoming apparent in recent years, right? You saw, for example, Alexander Lukashenko in, in Belarus in, in recent years try to position himself in his country as a as a sort of bridge between the East and the West. That, you know, quickly crumbled, uh, you know, upon the, the public, uh, you know, protests in the wake of the stolen election in, in the summer of 2020 in Belarus, uh, and as well as you just highlighted, the you know countries within the European Union that in the past have tried to maintain pragmatic relations with Russia uh, to you know serve as some sort of a bridge as well between East and West, 
Germany in particular, you know, which under Angela Merkel obviously had this, you know, special relationship with Russia, not just because Merkel could speak Russian and, and Putin could, could speak German, but also because of the, you know, historical legacy, obviously, of, of World War II and the Cold War, and, and therefore the, the moral imperative that so many Germans felt to develop a workable relationship with Russia. I think that all that's gone, you know, so, so that, that's definitely gone. Um, in the rest of the world, outside of Europe, it's another story, right? As you highlighted, uh, you know, India has long been non-aligned, uh, and their number one priority is, uh, you know, to deal with, uh, you know, the challenge of, of China. Uh, and that involves purchasing Russian weapons. That's just the reality, right? So, yes, there's going to be deeper cooperation between the U.S. and India due to mounting tensions between India and China. But India views its partnership with Russia, despite all of its challenges and limitations, uh, as an important pillar of, of uh, Indian grand strategy. Um, we'll see if that proves sustainable, but my guess is that if the U.S. is serious about getting tough on China, then to a certain extent, the U.S. needs India more than India needs the U.S., right? Especially if the U.S. is committed to this so-called Indo-Pacific rhetoric, right? Without India, it's not Indo-Pacific. It's just the Pacific. Uh, so, you know, that would come with significant implications for the ability of the U.S. to craft a uh, you know, a, a geopolitical narrative that, you know, pr that privileges, let's say, the future of this maritime community, you know, over an expanding, uh, you know, Chinese presence uh, in the region that's both terrestrial and, and, and maritime. Uh, as it relates to China itself, and whether or not China can sit on the fence, that's going to be a very interesting issue to follow. Mm -hmm. And I think the most interesting issue to follow, right? China has thus far tried to stay on the fence, right? Because their partnership with, with Russia has deepened substantially over recent years. You saw, of course, you know, during the Winter Olympics, this, this long document released between the two countries in which, you know, it said that their partner, uh, partnership, you know, has reached new heights, it has no limits, etc. Again, not a full-blown alliance, but nonetheless, a deepening strategic partnership. Um, on the other hand, of course, China is committed, uh, nominally speaking, to the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity and non-interference in, in, you know, countries' internal affairs, this is an important pillar, you know, not just of Chinese foreign policy, but also of, of for example, the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, mm -hmm. which tries to, you know, uh, uh, embody, you know, a, a, a security organization for for the Eurasian space, and which also includes Pakistan and India. Now, may potentially expand to Iran as well. Uh, be interesting to see what happens on on the JCPOA front in the next few days, and whether that could create some openings on on, on that front as well. Uh, but yes, yeah, so China, you know, has these principles that it has you know, defended robustly, not just, you know, for its own selfish interests uh, in, in keeping other countries out of its own affairs, but because those principles also enjoy some appeal in, in much of the developing world. Uh, and China also, of course, wants to maintain to the extent that it's possible, even though it is stealing itself for a long-term competition with the West, it wants to maintain some sort of economic and technological access to the West. Although there will be barriers that will erect themselves, that's inevitable. But nonetheless, you know, China doesn't want to see, uh, you know, a complete rupture on that front right now either, because China is still modernizing economically at this front. It still is a rising power. It's not a fully risen power. Uh, and so, uh, you know, balancing all those things at the same time uh, is going to be very difficult. I mean, we've seen some great experts like Evan Fagenbaum write about this recently from, from Carnegie in recent days. Uh, this is going to be a major challenge for China. Whether or not in the coming weeks, months, years, China is going to have to pick a side, basically, and, and fall on one side of that fence, uh, I don't know. Uh, that, that's a huge unresolved uh, you know, question for me, and I think it's something that we should you know, pay very close attention to, uh, especially because there are lessons that we should be learning from the Euro-Atlantic space that we should apply to the Asia-Pacific space. Right. Well, I think that the core lesson that we need to learn from the past 30 years of Euro-Atlantic security and governance is that creating uh, a regional order from which, uh, you know, the most powerful country in that region, Russia, is excluded, at least from the core of that order, right? Russia is not in NATO, it's not in the EU, so it is effectively excluded from, you know, the, the core of the regional security order in its own region at a time uh, 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 when it wanted to join Europe, right? After the end of the Cold War, after the collapse of the Iron Curtain, Russia wanted to return to Europe, and it felt stymied. So if that's the core lesson, right, that you're never going to have a stable uh, regional order that excludes, by and large, uh, you know, the most powerful country in that region, that's a lesson we have to apply to the, to the Pacific theater as well, mm -hmm. right? We, we cannot create an Indo-Pacific strategy or paradigm as a, as a way of avoiding answering the question of what we have to do about China, right? 
We can't use an Indo-Pacific strategy basically to make China disappear, not to care about China's you know, uh, declared interests uh, and, and desire to shape its own region. Um, you, you know, the, the, the Indo-Pacific strategy, if it's going to be serious, needs to have a China strategy within it as, as a prerequisite. And I hope that we've truly internalized that. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. the geography of, of, of Europe, which is a, a continental theater, as opposed to, you know, the Pacific, which is a, a maritime theater, makes, you know, the, the, those two theaters different in some respects. But nonetheless, there are some important lessons for how to manage great power relations that we must apply um, because we don't want to make the same mistake twice. Uh, it, it could be very, very dangerous over the long term if we do, especially seeing as you know we've seen uh, Vladimir Putin since the start of this crisis uh, threaten the use of, of nuclear weapons. Um, we don't know how serious he is about that, obviously, but nonetheless, I think it's best if we don't see that uh, you know such tensions repeat themselves on, on a second front as well. I, I, well. I couldn't agree more than what you've said there. But I, but I do fear, just looking at congressional debates over the last few days, that rather different lessons at the moment have been uh, learned. That is, that uh, we we were warned about a Russian invasion. We should have actually made uh, taken preemptive measures, and now we're beginning to see exactly that sort of thing being said about Taiwan, uh, with this dispatch of a high level. Uh, group of congressmen to Taiwan, I think, yesterday, uh, with this backdrop of, we've learned a lesson, the lesson is that we must uh, preempt. And that's and I find uh, it very disturbing. It, it, it certainly is uh, disturbing. It's difficult. I mean, obviously, sanctions in the case of, of Russia have failed. Uh, you know, both in this crisis, but also over the past eight years to deter Russia from pursuing what it views as its core interests. And remember, you know, Ukraine is a separate country from Russia, whereas Taiwan is viewed by China and also by the United States, by the way, as being mm. a part of China. So it's an even, you know, more uh, important issue. Uh, both issues have to do with, you know, li- the the question of the boundaries of of the Russian people, you know, the Russian world, you know, and and the Chinese nation, etc. So there's a parallel there. But you know, even more so in the Chinese case, you know, this this is an issue that that China wants to see resolved somehow on its own terms. Um, so, you know, would imposing would, uh, would imposing massive preemptive sanctions on Russia have deterred, you know, Russia from invading Ukraine? That's a hypothetical question, and we'll never know. Uh, but one thing we have learned is that you know, unity between the U.S. and, and its European allies has proven essential uh, uh, to uh, you know apply very severe sanctions on Russia. Uh, and if you want to see that repeated in the case of Taiwan, then you can't impose the measures preemptively because what the European Union cares about. Um, is respect for the so-called rules-based international order for international law, et cetera. And uh, under international law, you can impose these restrictive measures, um, you know, as a retaliatory measure, you know, in, in, in response to something, you know, wrong that has been done. Um, uh, but, you know, you, you can't just impose them preemptively for strategic reasons, right? That's, that's an issue, right? Uh, sanctions theoretically should be agreed at the multilateral level, at the, at the level of the UN Security Council. So if you want to maintain transatlantic unity on, on the front of sanctioning China, uh, you're not going to be able to do it if you impose sanctions preemptively, at least as, as far as I understand. We had a panel on this at the Center for European Policy Studies just last week, in which we got into the weeds of this issue a little bit. And that's one of the uh, the ideas that, that came out 